Okay, I'm gonna hope that I'm hope that I'm live. We're right next to the playground, which is gonna make things really, really, really exciting, enthusiastic. Anyway, um, good evening and welcome to the beginning of uh, uh, Lunch Meat Festival and to the uh, start of our Lunch Meat Symposium. Uh, my name is Peter Kern, and uh, I'm an artist, a musician, and I run a website called CDM, cdm.link, and uh, for about 10 years I've been writing about music, and, but also visual technology. So part of what was exciting to me about Lunch Meet and, and getting to know these folks for the first time last year was I was really, really excited about how committed the curatorial team at Lunch Meet was to visuals. So those of you who know this crew know this already, that uh, year-round uh, these folks are, are in the trenches working on live visual stuff. Hello, welcome. Working on live visual stuff, um, making installations, going into clubs, sometimes going into really underground clubs and uh, with kind of no budget and some gear, trying to see if they can make something visually appealing. And I really like this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of uh, seat of your pants sort of underground approach that could also scale to, to bigger stuff and uh, like, uh, uh, like the installation that they did over the weekend to, for Signal Festival. So that whether they're given a little bit of stuff or a lot of stuff that they can kind of make something happen. Um, I really appreciate it about these people. So this year, this year we got to, to work together and say let's put together a program so that on top of the festival itself, on top of all the kind of interesting AV stuff that's happening, that um, let's bring some conversation and discourse into it. <laughs> interesting, and uh, we're going to see how, the, how, how conversational it is. Um, but because we don't really get to talk enough about um, the, some of the work that we do. So a lot of times, uh, you know, people I think are very aware of the music, they're very aware when they go out to festivals when there's a visual spectacle and the impact that that makes and, and maybe the uh, iPhone photography they take of that. But very rarely do they get to know some of the people behind it or the process by which this happens. And um, a, a lot of the people come from really interesting backgrounds. So today and tomorrow both, we have, um, we have artists who come from design, who come from architecture, they've come from fields uh, uh, far from music, they've come with a, a physics, with one person with a physics degree. And they've come from these diverse disciplines and uh, uh, come together to, to work with music to expand the meaning and the significance of that music in, in live performance. So our goal over tonight and, uh, tonight and tomorrow uh, in the prelude to these festivals is to bring in some of those people so that they can uh, talk to you about, about what they do. But to kick things off, um, the first thing I wanted to do was talk a little bit about the uh, event that we had on um, Sunday. So I came here a few days ago and got to spend some time in Naona um, with some, got at least, at least one workshop participant in our crowd. Um, but for what the uh, lunch meet is calling their inputs, and the inputs are uh, a chance for us to kind of work interactively, work interactively with people and... Um, <laughs> oh God. Uh, I really hope that they could switch to this camera. I was going to talk actually about uh, perspective, forced perspective. <laughs> I, might, I might have a more uh, dynamic uh, human uh, approach to that than I expected. Um, so anyway, <laughs> this is more entertaining, I think, than what I was thinking, so I lost my train of thought. Um, there are the kids, for those of you on the internet, there are some kids, kids running around as we do this. Um, but with the inputs, uh, run by my friend uh, Gabriela Prochatska, we have um, a, a series of, uh, in, of kind of interactive experiences with artists from out of town, myself included where people here in Prague uh, come together and for various hands-on workshops. And um, the, the theme of mine I called digital, sort of digital object theater. The idea was to uh, get the participants into the process of making things using physical objects. 
and not just kind of the world of uh, the world of the computer. But what I will do now, which I realize is more ambitious than I expected, <laughs> is I wanted to talk a little bit about what these worlds are of the real and the and the virtual. Um, so. Actually, I'm going to start with this. <laughs> and I just need the, I guess I need the projection from the laptop. Hopefully. Can I get the projection from the laptop? We didn't disconnect it. Well, while I wait for a visual, I'll try to I'll try to describe what I'm describe what I'm going to talk about. We become very aware in in talking about visuals of the the life of screens, and in particular in visual performance, uh, the world of this screen that lives behind you. So, because all of us experience so much of, go ahead, um, because so much of us experience our reality these days through our screens, through this, like the screen on our phone and the screen on the computer, I think there is a, a tension between our desire to work with these tools and these machines in our performances, in the, in the stuff that we make, um, and, a, and a, a certain anxi natural anxiety about being sucked into this, uh, um, into this kind of screen reality. And particularly, you know, speaking as a, there we go. Speaking as a person kind of has worked as a VJ or a visual artist and hung around other VJs and visual artists and people doing audiovisual performance, you often hear complaints about you know, complaints about what's happening behind me. Complaints that all of the visuals live in this in this rectangle uh, behind you on stage. But I thought it would be great in this opportunity to um, ref not to fear this thing, but to kind of reflect on what it is and then think about what sorts of uh, other, other things we can do around it. So I think if you understand what this thing is, then you have an opportunity to really f use, it, uh, use it in interesting ways and kind of use stuff around it. So this has been another of the sort of years of VR. And uh, the, the uh, Facebook was uh, just last week, or um, time travels fast in America. I think it was last week. Last week, showing uh, showing off their VR um, VR experience, and you all invariably have pictures like this one of someone wearing something ridiculous on their head. Um, but I want to I want to um, kind of imagine. Oh, I see we're we're like two separate screens now. Cool. Okay. Um, I want to kind of think about what this thing is. So here's the image of the, of the v VR as we know it. And here, <laughs> this is really going to be challenging. Um, here's kind of where it comes from. In fact, in this engraving from a, a, a picture of the way that Brunelleschi worked, we see that the, um, the way to visualize what we now know as uh, um, uh, perspective projection from the drawing world, from the graphical world, was to stick something in front of your face. So I was, I was struck that this picture of um, illustration of Brunelleschi really looks like the, uh, like the person wearing a VR helmet. So, Part of what's able to suck us into the world of the screen is the fact that looking through the screen, we get this uh, perspective illusion that, that uh, people with a graphic background know from, from working in graphics. Um, so we, we're able to at least kind of treat our eyes and looking this thing, even if we're watching Netflix, to a world that, that looks like the three-dimensional space that we have around us. So, Part of why I wanted to think about that was to come back to the, 
what the significance of that stage space is and where this sort of virtual reality that exists behind the screen came from. Um, I'm not personally so excited about, about this um, in that, not that I don't like to be alone, um, but if I like to be alone, um, I don't necessarily need this kind of three-dimensional world on my head. What was sort of exciting to me about AV performance, or the reason I'm excited to go to Lunch Meat Festival for the next three days, is this chance to, uh, this is a chance to, uh, um, to, to kind of experience something with all of you, as we're <laughs> vividly experiencing now. You know, when you get into a real space and there are people around or kids playing or whatever, um, you, uh, you have a totally different experience than just strapping something on your head. So if we can begin to understand what, what's, the, what's the reality as we project it in audiovisual performance? What's the source of that and uh, the kind of sources of that, of that content? How is that constructed? And then how does it exist in the performance space? Um, if, if we really understand the totality of that, then I think we as artists can kind of decide how to use that uh, medium and to use those dimensions. Um, so let's go back to the let's go back to the world of the theater. We can well we can go let's go back the other direction, which is and I'm thinking of thinking of like simplifying this a little bit. Why do we have this why do we have these rectangles? And why do those rectangles uh, why do we have these rectangles behind us sometimes when we play music? Um, and why do we put stuff on those rectangles? Well, the, the simplest answer to that is that an audiovisual performance comes from this. Um, AV performance inherited this rectangle from the cinema, and the cinema literally inherited this rectangle uh, from the uh, from the theater uh, the theaters that the cinema inhabited so they were the first movie theaters like the first movie theaters in the United States um, took advantage of the fact that there were a bunch of empty uh, they took over a bunch of empty uh, literally empty theaters that had been uh, uh, used for theatrical performance and so part of what they got was the, the this rectangle and they got this thing around the rectangle. Um, the proscenium, and the, um, this through centuries and centuries of theater, we inherited this, this frame so that you have an audience. Uh, you have here a big hole, and that big hole was originally left for the orchestra. Uh, and then the stage, and various stuff behind this curtain. But to kind of separate the, the, the stage reality from the audience reality, we have this uh, proscenium frame. And I think if you look at the stage setups over the next three days, you'll see some echoes of this, some echoes of, of this kind of cinema, uh, cinema experience. And um, theater proscenium's go back uh, in common use at least 500 years. This is uh, Teatro Farnese, um, which is uh, mid-1500s. Take a quick look. It's not the first proscenium, but it's one of the oldest surviving prosciniums in the Western world. And so it's, uh, again, we get this kind of rectangle that lives around the theater space. And that rectangle separates the, this stage space from the audience. It also lets you know that kind of what, that there's, a, there's some significance to whatever happens here versus what happens here. So here, in, you know, in the, in the audience is the kind of the, our reality, our real world, all of you are sitting there. And then in the stage space, this is the kind of imagined, uh, the imaginary world. That's the world that I'm living in, uh, <laughs> where I also kind of shut off some of the other reality around me. Um, and um, in, at least in the, in the Western world, uh, In the Western world, this, this theater tradition is, is directly inherited um, from Greek classical theater. 
This is the Swan, Shakespeare's famous theater in London. Uh, it's a theater in the round, but you see it also has the separation of the stage space and then this kind of, this sort of building behind. Um, if we go back to the Greek, ancient Greeks, uh, ancient Greeks and Romans, These theaters are built to, according to the same model. Actually, let me give you a, a photo of what this looks like. Here we go. This is an artist's conception of what, this, what those theaters looked like before they became the sort of ruins that we know today. Um, now we have, to, we have to kind of invert the relationship here. So this is, this is where we've inherited theater's proscenium for, from. So the scene is this, this sort of building back here and sometimes the action would happen back in this building. And this frame that we get in the cinema and the theater comes, comes from this structure that, that frames um, uh, these buildings where the actors hang out and everything happens. Um, remember that in the Greek theater you had a, a chorus or an orchestra and they inhabited this, um, this forward space between the audience and the action. So actually when you watch a symphony orchestra uh, in front of a stage, in front of a ballet or a music theater or whatever, they are um, the direct descendants of this idea of putting the people making the musical accompaniment between the audience and the action. Um, so we've gotten this, <laughs> we've gotten this separation between the sort of real and the imaginary, the audience and, and what they're imagining is happening in the, in the action uh, from this architectural structure from the ancient, uh, uh, ancient classical uh, folks. And then we should consider that all of the stuff that we kind of take for granted in terms of how we look into imaginary worlds uh, has come from mediating cinema mediating between technology and our, and our sort of Western traditions of, of how we model reality and space. <laughs> Let's play find the cursed mouse cursor. Yes. <laughs> um, some of these considerations are, are, are practical in that you, um, I had some examples from Asian theater, they also have kind of similar separations. Um, this is a traditional no theater and they use this structure where the stage kind of thrusts out in the audience and there's this sort of bridge out to it, but also sort of exists in architectural space. Here's Chinese opera where it's just a platform that lives uh, out in the, um, uh, and then the crowd gathers around it. So, so it, it's, there's still, e even, even if we're talking Eastern theater instead of the sort of Western theater, um, there's still this kind of idea of there's an, some sort of construction, some sort of architectural space that puts the performers up where you can see them. So part of this consideration is practical. And then also allows you to create scenography that, you know, uh, uh, gives those actors some, some space to play in. Um, so, what I wanted to do with uh, kind of thinking about how we, uh, th how we want, how I wanted us to think in this workshop, and also how I wanted to kind of think about some of the uh, audiovisual work that we see, was to 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 think about how that how that space is created and and. Um, so part of what happens is, if you only work in the computer, or kind of only think in terms of the computer, then you're only kind of thinking about content as it exists, uh, as it, as it exists in this virtual construct of the machine. Um, so one way to get out of that uh, was what we did this week, which was to um, kind of get our hands on, and there's, there's this glitching out in the digital space. Um, but so our participants, I wanted to kind of go back to object theater and, and shadow puppetry and um, think, 
partly about our source material and how those can exist in physical space and, and how we can work with sort of different elements for our visuals instead of just kind of the flatness of, the, of, of starting entirely in the box in the computer. So we got together, we used an overhead projector, which is kind of an old trick from uh, an easy way to kind of create, to create projections and to change scale of objects. Um, we did some photography, so we had this uh, light box that I brought in, and, and um, this team kind of worked with that. And um, we put all those together in Neona. Um, and also kind of th thought a little bit about moving to, um, moving to the axis of thinking about physical and optical work and not, and not just this sort of electronic virtual world. Um, and so uh, let's actually watch some video of how that worked out. video unfortunately doesn't have uh, sound this time. So one of the things that I had done as, a, as an undergraduate was I got to work with a, a choreographer and theater director named Dan Herlin back in New York. And um, I really enjoyed that we got to spend some time um, just working through movement quality. So working, in a, working with a dance program, working with kind of the movement, just movement of the body, and working with Dan, um, getting a chance to work with puppetry and objects and, and shadow puppetry. And this was doubly interesting to me personally because I spent some time playing uh, uh, Indonesian, Javanese, and Balinese gamelan. And there are also, uh, th those musical ensembles also work with puppetry. So, um, you know, even when you're kind of working in the world of the computer, sometimes it helps to pause and take things out and, and kind of really think about moving things around around physically to sort of experience the fact that your mind is connected to your body and, and the, your body, the way that your body connects to objects in your environment. So this is some of our, our, of our process. Um, of course, the, the other nice thing is when, when you add the camera, you add this ability to take this perspective as we see it, the way that we kind of through our eyes relate to the world and, and move spaces that you've created in the physical world into some kind of virtual construction. So I was in, it was interesting that kind of without any guidance that about half of our participants on Sunday went to the direction of animation and kind of produced a video as the end result. Um, and then this, this group of folks uh, um, worked in the realm of, of performance. And also kind of unprompted, we, we had to kind of add this movement, this movement characteristic. So we know we've seen in this kind of, when people might label it post-digital or something, we've certainly seen in some audiovisual work, uh, groups like uh, Transforma in Berlin, who, uh, some others who kind of work with photographic techniques. You see people working with optic, uh, optical techniques. Um, but I, uh, rather than kind of view that as some sort of reaction to the computer, I would kind of see them as all part of the broad spectrum of stuff that you can do in visual, in visual work now. You have the ability to, there's really nothing stopping you from using any combination of optical materials, physical materials, objects, and so on. Also, I think um, I mean, I find this in electronic music, too. I don't know about all of you, but I think there is kind of the way to, to escape a vortexes in which you can't make decisions um, is sometimes to kind of to really make something physical. So the part of the advantage of live performance is you're really sort of forced to make something happen in, in real time, you know, whether it's moving stuff around on a projection screen or turning a knob or whatever it is. Um, so I always find that kind of forcing yourself into that performance scenario is, is useful. Um, but it's, it's generally my belief that we can take some of these kind of techniques and 
and really become more aware, more conscious of, of why, we, why we're drawn to making particular choices. So when you see the sort of visuals from the, the, the uh, Raster Noton crew, or now Raster and Noton, but um, when you see this kind of pictorial space that turns this into something painterly and abstract, um, there's a significance to that. When you see the same rectangle used in a narrative cinematic way, uh, where there's film and the film has kind of normal camera perspectives, um, I think that there's a particular uh, significance to that as well. Uh, Katarina, who joins us later today, is working in this, this kind of new space of hyper-real, intentionally uh, artificial-looking uh, 3D generative graphics. Um, so that, that sort of aesthetic direction plays with the fact that we're now surrounded by these synthetic, uh, artificial 3D visuals and, and sort of asks what the, uh, what the significance of that is and what the aesthetic possibilities of that can be. And I think that um, if I were to kind of wonder w where kind of audiovisual work might develop next, I, th I think it, it may be an awareness not just of pure aesthetics, but an awareness of, you know, what space and what's perspective. Um, particularly kind of coming back to this example, this question of, of, of virtual space. If, if our computers are, and our phones are capable of generating augmented reality, virtual reality, um, then we may start to see the immersive environment of performance in a new way too. You should ask the question of what are we looking at through these rectangles? Is it some kind of flat abstract world? Is the environment a, a bit like lighting where we're kind of, you know, um, dunking people in some sort of uh, abstract uh, environment or, pictor uh, or painterly environment? Um, or does it uh, call on uh, some other particular kind of perspective? So um, it's, it's especially striking to me that we wouldn't, we wouldn't sort of be driven to create these kind of realities, this ability to create displays that uh, change perspective as you rotate your head. I think if we didn't already have this tradition of uh, one point, two point, three point perspective in art. Um, sure enough, I found these great images of Albert Durer working with uh, drawing machines. Apparently GIFs do that. I don't know how well you can see what's going on, but so um, Albrecht Durer, the, the sort of famous uh, engraver, was um, an absent kind of computers, was doing the things that we do if you're using Cinema 4D or some sort of three-dimensional world, mapping out all of those, um, uh, using these kind of interesting drawing machines. Where, um, I mean, this is a kind of an early, uh, let's say, optical, physical, augmented reality. You know, if you don't have an iPhone to kind of map this 3D virtual environment onto the world, then you get your uh, lovely model over here. You get your, um, uh, you can create a physical grid and, and, and map that. Uh, and and um, so Durer and others were, were not just trying to figure out perspective in their head, but were tangibly exploring it um, in, in, in their world and inventing machines to do that. And, um, you know, we, 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 it's funny that we use the word live cinema, but I think there's not a whole lot of cinematic uh, analysis of, of what's happening in, in, in visual performance or VJing. Um, and, and it's actually the perfect place to be aware of that. Um, so, keeping in mind that we come from this tradition of the theatrical world, where you look through a window, and see another reality on the other side of that frame. Um, the fact that for the past century we've had access to an, a, the ability to both have that window and to change perspective in it should be really, really, really relevant. Um, you know, so that this is a um, this is a graph from uh, Alberti's treat treatise on, on perspective that tried to understand how those shapes. Uh, uh, it changes, you change your point of view. Um, 
smart cinema um, plays with plays with these kind of interplays of different perspectives. Um, with a, you take a, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to make us slip into like film crit class, but these are things that we're all familiar with. You know, we have both the kind of objective perspective. Um, we have, um, so I'm going to take uh, Hitchcock's um, Vertigo as an example. You have both this kind of uh, objective perspective, where you're sort of looking in on the world from from further away, and that's closer to what's happened in the theatrical tradition. Um, but from the same film, we can also switch to a subjective perspective, first-person perspective. So here, my, my hand is reaching out as somebody's falling off the building. And um, you know, we also cinema, theater, and cinema are also kind of the the foundation of uh, computer graphics in other ways too. So this is another uh, another perspective shot, uh, another point of view shot. This is from the movie Terminator. Because we have to remember that this is Terminator in 1982. Video games didn't look like this in 1982. Um, so part of the reason that we have this kind of body of video games that have this kind of particular perspective and overlays and stuff is actually that those things appeared in cinema first. So we, we have all these abilities to, kind of to, to uh, shift perspective and, um, uh, from film. So I think it's kind of also interesting to be aware of how are those perspectives sort of, uh, um, how do they read into, uh, into uh, sort of audiovisual performance, VJing and so on, um, and how are there uh, new forms introduced? Um, the other thing that I did with our group that we kind of looked at as a model uh, on Sunday, so outside of the Western tradition, uh, China, South Asia, and um, uh, Indonesia, this is from Indonesia, have a tradition of, uh, amazing tradition of shadow puppetry. So this is another way to sort of, um, optically uh, mess with force perspective, uh, layers, uh, and, and depth. Uh, in, in, in shadow puppetry, whether you come from an Indonesian tradition or, or something new, you um, can change the clarity or, or blurriness of objects by moving them back and forth from the screen. Um, with shadows and light, you always have a two-dimensional plane, but you can still create some kind of three-dimensional illusions uh, just by uh, modulating the distance of the thing that's creating the shadow from the screen. So we've seen that as well. So this is how, we, this, that was our project for Sunday. I wanted to kind of kick things off with, uh, with this sort of set of thoughts about, um, about kind of what, this, what the space around a performance is, what the significance of those different parts of the space. Um, just to kind of close on that thought, I'll go back to my diagram of a Greek theater. Actually, here's a better one. Um, this sort of archetype is so embedded in our minds um, that I think, I think we'll look around and see it in the different, different environments that we're in. Um, so, again, kind of separating significance from practicality. It's any kind of public spectacle, you're still going to have this sort of, there is an audience, and the audience needs, there's something the audience wants to see, and you have to make that visible to the, to the crowd. Um, so some of this is just comes purely out of that practicality. Let's have some kind of stage space. Let's either elevate it or elevate the audience so that everybody can see it. Um, sight lines are kind of value in any performance. Um, but some of the kind of, some of the sort of more philosophical signifiers that are embedded in this are, I think are also, we, you might see lurking in some way around, around lunch meat festivals. So take a look for these kind of rectilinear planes that become imaginary worlds. Look for in front of the stage it's kind of, it will be interesting to see sort of like what happens immediately in front of a stage. 
Um, somehow, what was the orchestra pit has turned into the pit for photographers, at least in electronic music. So there's still, at the very edge of the space, there's still this kind of trough where something's happening. And uh, now that, that's a bunch of people with SLRs with long cameras on them, maybe. You still have this kind of rectangular stage space, something going on there. Um, we're lucky in lunch meet that we're not just seeing guys behind CDJs. We're also seeing things like uh, uh, stage shows with dancers and other stuff going on. So there are other kind of physical, theatrical action happening. Um, and, and definitely be aware of, um, or we can ask some questions of what, what's going on with all of this. Uh, the, the scene proscenium, uh, this kind of world that imaginary uh, stuff comes out of. I grew up in the uh, Orthodox Church, the Eastern Church, and um, in the, uh, the, this is the Syrian Orthodox Church, but in the Orthodox Church we also have this kind of, um, something that looks very much like the Greek uh, uh, scene. There's a structure with a bunch of doors, uh, the priests go back in there, do something with incense, come out. It's not always really clear what's going on in there. But we have these also kind of backstage environments uh, that, that um, the professionals come and go from, or the superstars or headliners of Lunch Meat Festival. So that's, that's what I wanted to ask. Um, this sort of wanted to pose to us or kind of questions in my own mind and thinking about how I work and how other people are working. So I thought I'd use that to kick things off. I think we, I don't know if we'll be able to hear the questions. We can try. Uh, I think we have a minute for questions before we kind of go into the next segment. If anybody wants to dare ask, and we can probably send a m microphone to the crowd. But thanks for listening in this sort of unexpectedly exciting uh, acoustic environment. I hope, I don't know if that's, for those of you who might have weirdly have tuned to two or three people who have tuned on the internet, I don't know if that's I is as interesting for you as it is for us. So either you're wondering um, why we're doing this in what seems to be a madhouse, or you're just wondering why I'm distracted. Um, if you're wondering why I'm distracted, it's because there are lots of kids running around and exciting stuff happening. If you can hear them, yes, those are, then you're hearing them with me. So any questions or comments from the audience? Am I like, weird? Um, theater history sidetrack. I will say, so we had, we had kind of one, we had one day for the workshop. Um, because we had one day, we sort of stuck to this process of moving stuff around on projectors and um, doing small scale photography, so uh, this stuff. Um, my feeling, it's going the other way. Uh, you know, these things really take time, and um, one of the things I said at the class was when I worked with people who really, you know, my background is in music, when I worked with people who had really a, 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 a puppetry background, they spend sometimes weeks or months just practicing to get the movement quality of a particular uh, object. Um, so it was really necessary for us to kind of take this, this single day and, and kind of understand visually how stuff was working, move it around. Um, it did mean that we stayed very much in this, this world, the kind of, so some people saw one of my photos on Instagram and said, oh, that looks really crafty, I guess, like not so digital. Um, but I think that, that that was kind of necessary in order to get the, um, to, to really kind of get some experience practicing this stuff. We really, the time really flew through the course of the day. Um, I think if I had more time, <laughs> um, it's, it's nice to kind of pull back from the digital world and work in the physical for a while, and then sort of layer on uh, a kind of digital environment. It's sort of like complex, uh, cooking, you know, you sort of do one one process where stuff is simmering, you know, then this kind of take those ingredients and put them somewhere else. I, uh, I definitely got the, the feeling with this that sort of in a multi-day workshop, you would kind of almost spend one day just working with the, the movement quality of physical things and then like the next day uh, seeing what would happen if you brought those into the computer and maybe the next day seeing what would happen if you just did 
stuff with projection, uh, projection mapping back into the real world. Um, but it felt like there were multiple stages. We'll have to see from our participants, uh, from our, our talks, if there's something similar. Yeah. Any audience questions, or shall I move on to our next talk? I at least feel like a after that, it's a, it's a, the, the, it does feel like some of the crowd might be calming down. I guess we'll find out. But yeah, any other questions? Then I think I'm going to risk moving on to our next chapter. I'll try to double check that. Should I guess we bring Ignacio on first or hold on? Yeah, I think let's, um, let's take a pause and then bring Ignacio on to talk a little bit about his work. We hope. <laughs> Yeah, why not? Okay, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Thanks, Peter, <laughs> for inviting me. Sorry for my English, it's so basic, but I try to explain something. Okay, okay. Uh, it's really interesting, this discussion with Peter. A lot of input, and all my work is based on this kind of stuff because I'm involved in visual art. And I start studying engineer and architecture, something like scientific uh, degree. Uh, and then I moved to, to focus more on art and visual idea of what, what you, we see and why and the process that is behind this. And I think it, all this problem about screen uh, about perspective is more based on is radically uh, based on centering what are what the center is for us and probably I, I, I love the, the image from the Renaissance for the beginning of the drawing the idea of uh, the representation of the world because before it was more dense it's completely different it's symbolical it's uh, more digital, but after the Renaissance, everything became more a problem. How do I represent this reality that is in front of me? There is just a distance, born this distance between us and what we see. Like there is a world outside of us, and there is another world inside of us. And so the brain. So I remember a wonderful drawing, an etching from the Renaissance. There is basically um, a, a, an artist uh, self-portraying himself like the head and he put himself inside the eyes and watching through a hole inside the eyes. And so uh, basically is a, a way that you are positioning yourself in a place and watching something else. And, uh, here born this kind of uh, perspective. You are basically tracing a line, fixing a point, is your infinity, and everything is going in this direction. And there is just, for this is a unique point of view, also if there are accidentally, but generally is based on this. Are you watching something for a, a place? Now physics, and every study about perception and so on change completely this vision. Everything is more, uh, um, you can flip from one point to another and it's not a, 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 a contemporary stuff. They just understand this in 17th century, uh, just one century after this uh, Renaissance period. They understand throughout the, scientific method that you can change your position 
go flip in another position and watch yourself from outside. And so this, like, this process changes everything because you start to um, understand the process that is throughout your watching. And you can see how your um, uh, behavior, how your, uh, uh, how the, uh, the deepness between the and the other, how the relations in between is so basically in structured in your watching. You are watching what you want to watch, you are changing what you are you watching, you are continuously manipulating landscape, uh, uh, everything, you are contaminate everything. And so when you say uh, okay, the screen in my, high, in my eyes, what is this? Is uh, reality, is another stuff? Is the same answer that we made to ourselves since the beginning. What is dreaming? Is reality, is not reality? Paradoxically, probably the dream is more real than reality because we are uh, more active in this uh, uh, action. We are, we are building what you are seeing, everything. Actor, also the people that are inside the dream are uh, our actor. And so we are building this world. And so w when we, we were sleeping, we are completely uh, 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 touching the, the world in the real way. And I love this um, uh, problem between analog and digital because it's, uh, it's focusing on one of the main questions that today we have because we are uh, managing how, how can I do the, with this mechanical things that I program and in some way it's, it know how can visualize something in front of me. And it is impressive because I do everything of this. This is just a, a case, plastic case, with some metal inside, some wire. It's nothing. It's, it's originally, is just a mathematics logic inside. It's just this. The first computer was like just a logic on, the, on a paper. It's the Boolean, something very simple. One, uh, it's, it's a grammar, it's like uh, syntactic uh, stuff. You can write and information, and, and it's an execution. And so it's beautiful how this origin are uh, so uh, evident now that it's more easiest to see these things that this simple logic produce. But we have no uh, idea how, <laughs> how we can manage this, it. We are uh, surrounded by this. It's like a, a very powerful and strong uh, uh, falling <laughs> matter on our life. We are completely, because it's very it's easy to, to stay on the surface of this. And so, uh, for me, it's, it's so important to basically uh, analyze what is the, the origin of this, why. And so, uh, I, I don't know, I have an intuition. I, I <laughs> it's not mine, but probably it's very, <laughs> it's very old because the problem is very old. And because the digital is generally based on digital uh, is one yes no you choose <laughs> yeah it's just two channel and from uh, phase a a to phase b there is nothing in the middle and so just two faces black white uh, analog is just a continuous stuff is a uh, between a and b there is an infinite kind of state there is a an infinite density inside. And generally, this is from black and white. There is infinity kind of gray. Uh, there is no choice. There is no one or another stuff. We, we, 
our watching and our thoughts, our, may, uh, our perception is basically made by both these things. Because it's like in front of us, it's like an analog landscape flowing and continually blurring in front of us, uh, out of focus, continuous out of focus, but we, to orientate ourselves, probably we map this with a very clever drawing, like a crystalline structure that help us to measure continuously this changing world. It's very, it's very hard to, to be uh, positioned at the beginning of my uh, world, I start to talk about center. The center that uh, I, I was talking about was like a visual center in the line of the perspective of drawing. It's just a point. You just uh, can shoot to it and orient yourself to this point. But probably we, we are changing this kind of center and putting it inside is another kind of center, geometrically talking. Is, uh, uh, in Italian, is baricentro. Is, is based on uh, balance. Uh, is, uh, link, is linked to uh, the idea of force, of physical force, not to watching. Before to watch, you need to understand. <laughs> I don't know, it's, uh, it's more uh, deep, the, the problem. And so, when you are talking about a, a kind of center this is in, inside you and feel the, the, an energy, for example, that join you with the heart uh, or uh, uh, just help you to uh, link concepts uh, or uh, something like this, uh, everything is changing because you need to uh, change completely your idea of the world. And so there is no, the, the answer that was before, what's your reality, never exists. It's, it's inconsistent answer because everything, uh, my thoughts are real. My creation, my manipulation is, con is real. The problem is, is that the, the perspective is inside us. And so there is no other percep per perspective. It's all inside us. Um. Did you bring, you brought some stuff for us to look at too, yeah? This is sort of, um, yeah. maybe you can connect that to something we can see? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I bring some very uh, old stuff from the beginning of my, when I, I decide to move from uh, engineer and scientific to visual art and uh, uh, music. And I, I, I think that, uh, uh, I was very fascinated by the research of the beginning of the century, the past century, in which with the very low uh, techniques uh, equipment, they make like a very interesting uh, research about light, gravity, uh, perception. They, they work a lot. Now you see a, an impressive uh, media and techniques uh, equipment, but the, there is no focus, there are no, no answer. You just watch on it and like an, a passive uh, spectator. Um. Africa, what, what was your exact engineering background or? Sorry? Which, which engineering background did you have? It was uh, architecture engineer, uh, civil engineer okay. and architecture. But uh, in Italy, it's joined. At the beginning, it's all the same. And so mm. mechanics, uh, mm. physics. Mm. Thank you. 
heard all this, you as a human being, why don't you change? What prevents you? If each one of us asks that question, not verbally or merely intellectually as an entertainment, but ask that question more seriously and deeply, what's your answer? What's your answer to this problem that human beings have lived this way for millennia upon millennia? Why haven't they changed? Why haven't you, who are, the, who are listening now, why haven't you changed? You know, if you don't change, what the consequences are, you'll be national, nationalistic, you'll be tribal, insular, isolated, and therefore having no relationship globally, fighting, 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 building up more and more albums to destroy each other. Now, why don't you, if you are at all serious in this matter, why don't you ask yourself that question? Why am I, a human being, who have been through all this, why haven't I changed? What would be your answer? Either you are not serious, you want to live a very, very superficial life, and that superficiality temporarily satisfies you, or you really don't care as long as you have immediate pleasures, immediate satisfactions. Yeah, thank you. It was great. As I've seen these works before, but thanks so much for showing them to us again. They're really quite beautiful and uh, poetic. And, um, maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, this. The, um, you, you kind of hit at this a bit with what you were saying before. But maybe we could talk a little bit about um, wh why kind of inhabit this sort of monochromatic domain, or, or um, what's the sort of significance of kind of tonal weight in, in these films? You know. Um, is this, it, are these kind of formal ideas that could work in color too? Is it, is it really important to, to, to focus on that parameter? Is that something you kind of continue to want to do? When I, I decide to start to work with the black and white, basically to cut a tone and then intensity of light, uh, just to focus on low stuff. I, 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 I am interested in sculpture mm -hmm. and music is so linked to sculpture because it is based on pressure. 
uh, and with this kind of uh, uh, dual point, I can easily manage this because uh, you immediately uh, see like the white zone and the dark zone. The dark zone are low and the white one are high. So you can l watch to the sound in some way. All the sound is made with my brother. This is a musician's Lucy, you know? And basically uh, born together. So the video sometimes born... Uh, is very syncretic work on sound and <laughs> visual. And so... Did you ever play around with sound yourself, or...? Um, no, uh, no, I have two <laughs> good <laughs> brother. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, no, uh, I'm just focusing on yeah. visual stuff. I'm very, I'm in love with music, with sound and everything, um, but I studied like a passive guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So the uh, person who taught the input be before me was another friend of mine uh, uh, by the name of Robert Lippock, and he was sort of, I mean, we, I was going to ask about synesthesia, but maybe I should first ask about, about space. Is sound, I mean, given that you come from this architectural background, engineering background, yeah. is sound spatial to you, or is music spatial to you? I mean, obviously, you know, you hear music or sound in a space and you, and you get the spatial quality, but do you, do you kind of envision spaces in your head when you hear sound and music? Yeah, for sure. A sound uh, basically is like a, a wave yeah. <laughs> in a space. And so when architecture is space between walls, uh, less or more osmotic walls, but always limit on you. And so sound reacts in a very special way every time. It's very, it's so specific. <laughs> Depends where you are you playing is completely different, and basically it's beautiful because the the sound born with the echo echo you talk to a mountain and then come back, and so it's like to interact with and so basically it's a relation with architecture with its landscape or uh, artificial. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so we are so, we're surrounded by these wonderful flowers. <laughs> like, yeah. Uh, so it's kind of this highway way, uh, so we have all this color kind of against our... But they don't smell. Black. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, interesting. Well, and um, there, there's kind of a sculptural quality to some of these films, too, sort of like, like watching this wa water bubble. You, I mean, I didn't get the sense of... Um, uh, with all of these, I get the sense that there is a kind of a sculptural quality to the film. Or there's something kind of tangible about it. Yes. Uh, Sculpture is very strong, strange stuff because before it was like a managing a, a cube of marble. You carve it and then you extract some solid matter. Now sculpture could be something more liquid, uh, can interact with the virtual reality or uh, everything is more ephemeral. A sculpture also, uh, by the way, a song could be a sculpture. And so, uh, basically, I like the, the way in which uh, we, uh, we catch this sculpture a little bit on the concrete world. And so I like this uh, idea of not a solid box of marble, mm -hmm. but uh, some other matter some grainy matter, something that is in between. It's not a liquid stuff that you lose completely the uh, shape, the form, and so on, but have something to do with the uh, solid, but very sc little scaled. And so granularity is... Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, scale. Like them, uh, <laughs> we yeah. are like this. Yeah. <laughs> and so this... Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's also, well, I talked, kind of alluded a little bit to scale in, in film, um, but it seemed like in, in these sort of etudes, you're really kind of bringing us into a microcosm, into a smaller world. Um, where, where, where did that kind of motivation come from for these? Uh, come directly for the Renaissance. 
the idea of uh, w uh, talking about uh, macrocosmo and microcosmo and the, the man at the, in the, during the Renaissance was mid put on the center of this. Generally there is a man uh, with uh, open arms inside uh, an atlas. <laughs> Yeah, very rounded, like this. It's very the drawing is very similar to this. <laughs> that make it like a yeah. no. It, it represents thanks. Yeah. <laughs> it represents the idea of the universe that before was like a, a center with a, all circle, perfect center around. It's very uh, a, a synthetic uh, drawing of yeah. the words. And and there was something that you played with in some of these designs that you did too, right? There was, there was a kind of a microcosmos idea in some of the design work that you did for stroboscopic, yeah? Yes. Uh, well, I work for a different kind of label, generally based on underground music and techno oriented, very dark. Uh, and stroboscopic, I, I, I make stroboscopic with my brother uh, ten, 10 years ago, in a while. Yeah. And so this, uh, this video are, uh, were from uh, 2008, uh, 2009. And so basically it's really uh, atta attached to music concept. And so when we start, we were thinking on a kind of sound and we, we, we make like a, master, uh, a mastering studio to build our sound. And so we need a machine that make another kind of sound. And then uh, people call it compressed dub. I don't know, but it's very, we are uh, at the beginning working on a kind of uh, very physical sound that you need to, uh, to feel. For this, generally is a sound that is born just for clapping. And when I think about music, I think about subwoofer, uh, sound system or a uh, place like with the dimension of uh, a club. And I love the idea, this social idea of uh, sharing and living and experience with music. And so I love clubbing also. Did you bring anything else for us to look at or? Um, uh, I'd be, it's okay if not. Just a photo. I don't know how much you want to talk about your, your, your involvement here or how much you want to reveal. Uh -huh. oh, this is nice, yeah. Sorry? This is nice. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's an analog photo that I shoot on, uh, on the sea. It's uh, just uh, some sand put, put in the air. Mm. It's a gesture. And it basically, as it works, it's titled uh, To See the Wind. Like, is basically the, all my works is based on some invisible stuff, art. And, but I need a, a, a concrete gesture and a, a concrete matter to show him, it, him or her. And so it's a very simple thing. And I, uh, I like. Also, the, 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 the idea that you don't understand the scale it could be an explosion, an eruption, or uh, different stuff. Uh, we, we live in this world that uh, makes you responsible to understand and to... You need to be able to move, to move yourself, to scale stuff, uh, things. It's, it's just to move you far or more close. <laughs> and so, uh, basically, you need to know this. How, how important is it to you to sort of select parameters for a work and kind of to, to sort of constrain what you're doing with a particular project? So when we have this conversation all the time in sound and music, of, especially with the array of possibilities of our technology, um, how, yeah, how conscious is that process for you, kind of setting aside this is the medium that I want to work with for this project, you know, I, I want to kind of play with this range of tone or this partic these particular materials? Um, generally, it's an economical uh, 
process. Cioè, like nature is very economical. Try to do the better with the low. Mm -hmm. with uh, for me, it's the same. Generally, I start uh, is like an is more ecological <laughs> to focus on the answer and try to make them more uh, free of uh, of this disturbing stuff. And so I see in, the, in this moment, probably later will be more. But generally, technology in this moment is very a very low technology for our uh, thoughts that are very uh, far. Hmm. Uh, and so, in this moment, is the best way to act uh, with uh, no perturbation of this. You stay like you need six months to to learn a program, a software, to make something. Six months. I read. Uh, I read uh, ten books, <laughs> or uh, I can write something. And so, at the moment, I like uh, to be more smarter. Well, thanks so much, Ignacio. I, I could talk to you about this stuff all day. I feel like maybe our, or my brain at least, is getting kind of acoustically <laughs> fatigued. So thanks so much for your comments. And um, yeah, I really appreciate your insight. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Were there any, um, any questions for Ignacio? Um, if you've seen the exhibition, too, this is a, this, you might have somebody to ask about that. I actually haven't seen the exhibition yet. Um, but you another, but you're in it. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. We should go. We should really go. We should go look at it. We should all go look at the exhibition. I'm in it. Ignacio's in it. Neither of us have been there, so who knows what it looks like? I don't know where it is. <laughs> I do know where it is. I think at least through the power of the internet. Um, but there is. Uh, you'll see the the on the. Um, <laughs> it's exciting. Yeah. We, all of us. They're excited. They want to see the exhibition. <laughs> um, it's yeah. It could be worth seeing. Um, I think I can't quite see all of our panelists here. I'd love to bring our panelists out just because I feel like, yes. Because <laughs> I, think, I think our ability to listen in this environment is probably, well, we passed it a long time ago, <laughs> but uh, it's probably limited. And Kat Katarina? Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, so maybe we, maybe we join the panel. Yeah, sure. Unless you... And you have an SD card. Yeah. Uh, and we have a second mic. Hi. <laughs> Katarina and I have only talked virtually, so hello. <laughs> Good to meet you. <laughs> Welcome to our panel. And you have some stuff to show on your, you can't. <laughs> Struggling to hear you. Oh, OK. You, have, you also have some stuff that you brought along to, to show as well, or? I have some photos and a bit of video if okay. people are interested relevant. Cool. So to kind of round up the, the people that we selected for this, you know, um, today's interesting because we have people who kind of have their hands in a lot of areas. These aren't just people working as solo artists. Of course, as Ignacio said, is, um, he has this um, ongoing collaboration with music that covers design, covers video, it's sort of um, compre comprehensive ac across media in that way. Uh, and both the, both the people sitting with me also also come from kind of diverse backgrounds and have diverse products pro projects. So um, uh, Greg has also been involved in um, uh, kind of I would say sort of production in a larger sense. Mostly began with producing artists, but then you've had your hands kind of in how whole um, um, larger scale productions have come together it's sort of in this uh, in this audiovisual sort of stage show um, realm yeah yeah I, I guess I've moved I've moved into the area where I'm focusing on production in a larger sense yeah you have to yeah how's that better, <laughs> better. okay uh, so you're not a vocalist <laughs> I'm not a vocalist no. <laughs> So I started out uh, working at Warp Records. So I was working with the artists. Uh, I started doing business and legal affairs, believe it or not, uh, dealing with contracts. But my passion was 
the artist's output and the effect that had on the world because uh, I was a fan of the music, worked at the label, S started working with acts like Boards of Canada and Aphex and um, Clark was an artist that uh, kept pestering me by sending tapes like, please sign me, please sign me and uh, eventually I listened to the tapes just to get rid of him because I didn't want this guy phoning me all the time. It's like, oh, actually, this music's pretty good. Um, Wait, the, li literally, they were tapes? Yeah, literally tapes. Oh, wow. Yeah. Like the cassette tapes? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Uh, this is, you know, it's in 1999, so... Yeah. Uh, it's still, it's still a little past the tape. Not mini-disc or something. It's well, he did graduate to mini-discs. Yeah. Uh, so, I've worked with Chris for a long time. Mm. And after I finished working at Warp, I moved into management and Chris asked me to manage him. So at, at that point, I think the thing that I wanted to develop most was his live show, which because, you know, f 10, 15 years ago, he, he was just basically DJing with NPCs, um, which is a very exciting kind of fluid, fluid way of doing it. But I wanted something that was bigger that was really going to pull people's emotions throughout the whole show. So that started, a, well, I guess, a five, six, seven year long journey to end up with Death Peak, which is the show that's being performed tonight. What, what's involved in making something that's kind of that multifaceted sort of come to life? I, mean, I, was, sort of, I was sort of struggling with what, how to describe what you're doing or to give a term to what you're doing. Um, because there well, is, it's kind of not an easy word for that, right? Because we understand the kind of role of the music artist, but the sort of bringing together something like a stage show when you have all these kind of different logistics and different kinds of performances and, and media. Well, I think from my point of view, it involved making a lot of mistakes and listening. What, what kind of mistakes? What kind of mistakes? We, I guess, maybe 2012, 2013, we'd, we'd got to the first live show that I thought really was, was bigger. We had, we had a screen and we had an, an amazingly talented creative called Vincent Oliver who was, uh, had, had this amazing technical setup where he was sending audio to an oscilloscope and then we had a video camera, had a live feed of the oscilloscope on the screen. So it was technically really interesting. Um, but that was kind of lost on the audience. Uh, and we soon, we were very excited about this concept of the oscilloscope directly representing the music. Um, but a lot of people would say, oh wow, those are great computer graphics. And we were like, it's a bit more than computer graphics. Um, but so we realized that we needed something that was, that if we were going to put effort into the production, it needed to be more visible, it needs to be more visceral. And uh, so when we, so then I think at the end of 2014, uh, Melanie Lane, who Chris has worked with a lot uh, through dance, she's a choreographer, now Chris's wife, and they collaborated on uh, various projects. And I, I saw one of these projects probably about 2013 called Tilted Fawn. And it blew my mind. It was just really beautiful. Chris's music, her dance, choreography. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. How, can we, how could that come into the live show? And then at the end of 2014, I think uh, Mel and Kiani, who's one of the dancers tonight, uh, did, Mel had built something that we we tested in Dublin and it went down incredibly well. So we decided to develop that a bit more and we did a, a big festival show at Field Day with them both on stage and that was like, wow, this could really work. Just having the dancers, people just loved having the dancers to focus on and it took a bit of the emphasis away from Chris being behind a mixer, you know, kind of mixing stuff playing a keyboard, but this, would, this felt like a proper performance. This felt like something could get emotionally engaged with and surprised by. 
Do you have some of that to show us or to kind of give people an idea? Uh, yeah. I've, I've gotten to see some of this. There should be a, I think we, I asked if they have an SD spot. Um, no. Can we get, does somebody have an SD card reader? So we'd asked about this before, to get an SD card reader for Greg. So I don't, I don't see an SD, I see a CD-ROM drive. Um, I'm, not, I'm not seeing a response from our technical people. Yeah, we do? Okay. Okay. At least it's getting it's quieter now. <laughs> I don't know if that was your voice or just the time of everybody. It's nap time now. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sort of curious that the, the, the kind of shifting from... Uh, how, how, much is, how much is the kind of scale of the venue a, a, a function of sort of that you needed dancers and you needed choreographer, choreography and something as kind of subtle as just running an oscilloscope to the screen didn't work? Do you feel, was that kind of the, the, sc the scale of the venues, the, the, um, the, the, the size of the audience, or, or was, this, was this some kind of evolution in how you conceived the whole um, performance? I think there were a few things coming together there. So we were wanting to play bigger shows. And if you want to play a bigger show, you, you have to have a bigger show to play. So, so we sort of, like a guy on a laptop with a screen behind him, I think only scaled so far. So we needed something on the stage. So we'd, we'd, we'd seen Eamon Tobin have a, have a, very, uh, a very full, full stage uh, of stuff. So we were kind of thinking about what can we fill the stage with? What makes sense for Chris? Because it, it has to obviously relate to his aesthetic and his music. And so I guess it came about kind of seeing how well the dancers had worked. And then I think the biggest, the biggest uh, breakthrough was when we had what at the time felt like the most horrific failure and disaster. At, uh, it was the first, it was the, where well, we had two disasters in a row. <laughs> uh, in, twi in 2015, so we had uh, a new show, which was visuals, it was just a projector screen. We'd had a guy work on some new visuals. Um, so what we hadn't worked with before and the first show, which was Block, a big UK festival, was a big room, two and a half, three thousand people, and they had huge technical problems with projector, which basically didn't work until the last ten minutes of the show. So we had a blue screen, and that wasn't a great feeling, and then we had ten <laughs> minutes of visuals at the end. But the weird thing was, it, it worked, because they had really good lights in the room, and Chris, at that point, was had enough stage presence with like playing live keys and just being very active on stage. He does a lot in the show. And I was thinking, well, okay, well that worked quite well without these visuals. Then the next show, the following day, um, which is the Village Underground in London, again sold out, 800 people all very expectant. And I think two minutes into the set, the visual guy's laptop completely locked up and froze. And that was when, oh no, I'm melting, it's all gone horribly wrong. But um, our tour manager at the time had suggested, we bring, he, he knew a, a really talented light, lights guy who does lights at the Paradiso in Amsterdam. And he basically just took over seamlessly and just performed the most amazingly beautiful light show that was just flabbergastingly good. And then it was like, hmm, <laughs> maybe this is what we need, actually. Maybe, maybe lights and Chris's music is enough. And then when we added the dance element, that's when it all came together. And it was like, OK, now, now we've got something that feels unique. It really makes sense for Chris because of his relationship with Mel and the choreography. Uh, so we ran that through 2015, and then this year, it was like, okay, we're going to start from scratch. We're not going to have any, like, we're not going to have a screen. We're not going to have any visuals. We're going to have the dancers 
and then something else on stage, and Mel had this fantastic idea to build these custom LED screens, which just lend a sculptural element. Yeah, I was gonna, well actually, let's, let's give folks a view to, to kind of what you're describing. I don't know what you brought to show us, but and sorry that I'm leaving you. <laughs> like, we'll, we'll, I imagine this would all be the, the, all of us talking, but this also works. <laughs> Is your laptop ever frozen in an unrecoverable way during a gig while he works on? <laughs> has your laptop ever frozen in a way that you couldn't recover from in a gig? Okay. I can at least say I think mine hasn't. Yeah, it, it, it happens all the time. And a, a couple of times I've been performing with bands and had the same issue. Uh, but like, luckily, I was also in charge of the lights. So that's a great way to yeah. save the performance. Rescue. <laughs> yeah. So, so this was a long time ago, so it's a black and white picture uh, from 2015. So, uh, so this uh, sort of not quite as fierce lady at the back is Melanie Lane, who is Clark's wife and the brains and choreography behind a lot of the show. And in front of her is Kiani, uh, an incredibly talented dancer. So, of course, there's an element Another element I haven't talked about, which is, which is, of course, costume. Being a man, I don't really think about clothes very much. Um, but Melanie definitely did, and the costume element really, really makes the show. It means you can have different, different looks. The, the impact of the costume on the audience is, is really, really visible when you watch the show. And so there were several costume changes during the show. So that was how the show was looking in 2015. And then one of the early shows in 2017 was at the Funk House in Berlin. Uh, so, so here you can see Kiani and Sophia now. Mel, Mel stepped back into a pure choreography role, so we have some Sophia and Kiani. And you can see the, these, these LED panels which we made. So they were made by... Uh, another very talented visual artist called uh, Matt Bateman, who goes under the name Flat E. And he had mentioned to me in passing that he got a load of LED strips lying around in his office. And then I was like, hmm, we need, <laughs> we need something different. And Mel had been talking about building, building something sculptural on stage. And we did a few sketches and emailed the sketches to Matt. And he said, hmm, OK, I think I can do this in about two weeks. So, and they were like, oh, and by the way, we have to be able to fly them around Europe. They can't weigh more than 25 kilograms. And they have to fit in a, in a very small case. And he was like, hmm, <laughs> OK. Uh, and he, he made these amazing things. Well. <laughs> They're amazing when they work. Uh, and of course, they work flawlessly all the time. Uh, so here is a costume change. That looks like Kiani with a pyramid and a cap. And again, so it is just once you have full control of the lights and you've got the LEDs, which have lots of different looks, Lights of often colors, costume changes, props. There's just so much variety and so many atmospheres you can bring to the, bring to the stage. There's the funk house. So there's, there's Chris. He's quite important in the show too. Uh, doing some music stuff. So... The lighting director I have at the moment is a guy called Brian Kelly, who started working at the beginning of this year. And one of the first things he did was design this uh, kind of pyramid, triangle shape, which uh, we have built everywhere we go. Uh, because the album that the, this show is attached to is called Death Peak. And he had this amazingly simple and effective idea of building a peak of, of strobes and, and lights on stage. Brian is just next level in terms of his professionalism 
uh, of, of just working of getting the patches and the plots of every venue and festival in advance. He has 3D modeling software, so he can, uh, he, can, he can basically play and practice the show at home before we come out uh, all, with all the house lights and our lights and the LEDs. And then all the, these, these custom LEDs and our floor package, they're all, they're all controlled by DMX from his uh, lighting console. So here, another, another costume change. This looks incredible during the show because of the way the LEDs light them from different angles. This this shimmering, weird jellyfish thing that happens. So this is a different show. So this is, uh, this is later. This is Manchester International Festival. So you can see different costume, different lighting, completely different look on stage again. More jellyfish, it's more of a sort of sinister, dark jellyfish. Yeah, what's, what's your technique for working with these LED, uh, the, the f with working with Matt and uh, with Flatty on, the, on these LEDs? I mean, so this, they're, in some sense, it, it's not, you know, they're displays, right? There's, there's kind of content being fed to these, to these strips. Um, well, is he sort of on site helping you design this, or he's working with the lighting designer? How does that come together? No, well, they're, they're, they're in a way very crude things. The LEDs are very low res. They're literally, uh, in fact, I think I saw them putting them out on the floor as, as guides in the just floor lighting. They're very low res, so uh, there might be 2,000 pixels aside. So it's not really good for video content. No, so but I mean, you're, you're sending patterns to them, in other words. Well, huh? yeah. Brian just kind of did stuff that looked good. And we were like, yep, yeah, that looks good. That's fine. <laughs> so, so all, the, all, all, the, all the LED content came from Brian. Lots of block colors, simple movement, and all controlled by DMX. Sorry, I can't hear you. Do some audio analyze or just no, no, it's it's all manually controlled. There's, okay. there's, there's, we we tried, uh, we tried with the super scope tool with the oscilloscope. We were trying to have super tight sync. Um, it was really, really hard to do, and so we gave up. <laughs> all this different show or it's like a repeating the same show everywhere? Uh, the show varies from show to show because Chris uh, falls in and out of love with the music he's playing so uh, he gets he, to play the same show every night when, so, uh, so earlier in the year he played 35 shows in 40 days around America and if you're playing the identical show each night you just go mad so he was experimenting a lot with different tracks, bringing different tracks in. He also likes to write tracks and develop tracks on tour. So Honey Badger, which we just announced this week, is a, with, is a two track 12 inch. Honey Badger was developed on tour in the US and was just tried on tour and tweaked on tour uh, into this behemoth of a techno monster. Uh, so there's one look. Uh, what else have we got? This was uh, taken in London, so Chris had a nice headline show in London. And that again is a very sort of, you know, it's quite sculptural. It's, it's endlessly fun to photograph the show. There's, there's Always nice stuff happening. Yeah, so who, who's sort of managing these props? This is coming from the choreography side of things? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So Mel uh, designed and made all the costumes. Uh, and yeah, they're just fantastic. She's just got a real eye. An eye for what looks good, but most importantly, what works for Chris, because the, the costume and the choreography has to match the artist. And we didn't, we didn't want 
we didn't want very like synchronized to the music dancing particularly. Uh, that's that's not Mel's thing. We didn't we didn't want it to be like sort of. Uh, I'm just trying to think of the right word. We wanted it to be quite weird, because that just weird in the sense of quite abstract, uh, because that just that was just going to work well with the music. So I have a I ha have a short 30 second video. Ah, oh, cool. Uh, which will just give you a a taste of what it is on stage. If I can get this to play, yeah, there we go. Let's see. Wow, that's. Uh, <laughs> trying to get that to go full screen. Boink. Okay, it doesn't like that window. Ah, quick time seven. I miss you. Does that make everybody want to see it? That makes me want to see it. Sorry? I've seen it already, but it makes me want to see it again. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, there's something about, I mean, this is kind of the, back to the stuff that we were playing with over the weekend. Um, it sort of takes a choreographer, doesn't it, to kind of say, hey, look, this sort of tetrahedron prop, <laughs> like, you know, we're, we're, all so, we're always so into this kind of high-tech stuff and, and gimmicks, and particularly, particularly at these kind of festivals. Um, I guess it sort of takes a, takes a choreographer to say, like, you know, whatever, this, this shape that this kind of, uh, is, is, is meaningful, yeah. right? Absolutely, yeah, and the beauty of that is that it, it, that aesthetic really works for Chris, really works for Clark, because he's not really into kind of computer graphics. That's just not his thing. He's, he's more into very dirty, grainy, real-world uh, vibe, yeah. and this is that, so... It works. Well, thanks so much. I was just, this is a, that's an, somehow a segue to, to move to the, maybe to the opposite, <laughs> but somehow connected um, to talk to Katarina, who I think is into computer graphics. <laughs> you are into computer graphics. Uh, yes, <laughs> I am. Um, uh, not, just, not just big tetrahedrons that, and, and dancers. Um, yeah, but um, I th um, but you also I think like Greg really come from um, I mean so you've come from uh, so your graduate degree was also in archi architecture yes yeah <laughs> so also like Ignacio <laughs> yes um, <laughs> we have one and you're a physicist <laughs> ex physicist of sorts ex physicist ex physicist <laughs> uh, so and two architects um, but. Um, uh, well, tell us a little. Maybe you could tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing, uh, the work that you're doing now, or the work that people will see tonight. And how did you? Um, um, well, yeah. Let's talk about what you're doing now, which is not architecture either. Yeah. So uh, I prepared uh, a visuals for Saturday, for a DJ set of Nan Kole, uh, which is a like labor leader of. Um, I, I don't know if I say the name right. It's Oh, <laughs> which is uh, which is a specific uh, genre which origins in a, in a South African Durban. And uh, when I was creating the visuals, uh, I, I I kind of like dived into uh, the music uh, because it has a very specific sound. Um, uh, the producers they they have a certain palette, I would say, of, of sounds, and uh, uh, the sound has been um, kind of uh, optimized for uh, playing in uh, taxis. So, so some, some of the sounds are really like speaker wrecking <laughs> kind of sounds. And yeah, that was like the starting point of, uh, of for my imagination. I wanted to translate this sound somehow into a visual form, and uh, yeah, I, I had like a lot of ideas flying in my head, but 
Uh, I also wanted to relate a little bit to the topic of, of this year's Lunch Meat Festival, which is uh, like no idols or like idols as fake gods. Uh, so I wanted to give some story or meaning into the VJ set, but it, it has uh, been uh, completely created in uh, like 3D and in, in the end I'm gonna use some like natural footage as well because uh, the concept behind the idols was uh, I, I wanted to uh, visualize some kind of um, human desire for perfection or for uh, for uh, achieving something that's maybe not real to achieve and uh, in contrast with like getting getting loose and uh, kind of uh, giving up the human element maybe some it starts with like a very like perfect uh, simple objects maybe and and in the end it uh, ends with like natural footage and computer generated mess Yeah, I'm really interested. Did you bring? We, I think maybe you didn't bring stuff to show. You sent me. Yeah, I sent, sent me the Dropbox link. Um, I have mm -hmm. that, but that requires us swapping computers. I don't know if somebody is able to help us swap computers, but since I wasn't able to uh, move files over quickly enough, um, maybe I'll do that. Well, actually, wanna, I'm going to sneak at least sneak over and try to try to move files quickly. Um, so I have to ask a question that involves a long answer. <laughs> well, actually, I guess um, maybe that's the, that's the question. The, um, I mean, how did you wind up finding your way in, into this visual world? I mean, it's kind of, everybody today has, um, has, has had a kind of circuitous route in, into doing this. Um, <laughs> so I feel like the answer to this will be long enough for me to copy the files off my hard drive. But um, yeah. But I, I'm actually genuinely curious about that. Um, what, what, what kind of, what sort of attracts you to this in the first place? And for that matter, how do you wind up finding that it's something you want to keep doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, like, uh, <laughs> yeah, my journey, I guess, kind of like when I was studying uh, the architecture school, I was always into music and I was often in like music environment, so I used to do like, posters for, for bands or for events just like to earn some extra cash and then um, during my studies at the architecture school I met a group of uh, girls who ran an architectural student party which became uh, KSK as so some maybe people uh, in the audience know. Uh, it's like a regular uh, club night here in Prague and it always has a topic to kind of uh, explore through a dress code and drinks and uh, visuals and also the DJs try to kind of relate to the topic. And so I joined this crew and uh, yeah, we needed to do visuals and, and as we were kind of expanding and uh, occupying bigger venues with the possibilities to do the visuals, uh, I. St I just started with some like uh, gif <laughs> gifs and 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 yeah then I, then I got kind of interested in it uh I went to workshop at the signal festival <laughs> and and that's how like the I would say like passion for for this audiovisual stuff started what was the work what was the topic of the workshop or it was just a mapping workshop yeah okay but I haven't used like programs like Resolume or anything before, so that was new for me. And yeah, and, and so like being in this um, club event crew, uh, it, it, it's a great uh, space to kind of experiment and uh, like not really care about the result that much maybe and it's like ever changing and it's so fast uh, like the club scene is, is incredibly fast changing so that that's that was the best playground for me 
and also we kind of always tried to uh, expand the visuals into some little set design uh, and yeah that's it so I'm like interested that's also like maybe my like architectural background mm -hmm. wanting to occupy the space a little bit yeah, that's right. You said that, that that somehow somehow coming from architecture made you think spatially about the work that you were doing. So mm -hmm. that, w what does that mean exactly? Kind of you, you wanted to think beyond just this kind of flat cinematic uh, rectangle. Yeah, like either it's just uh, some decorations or, or sometimes we play with like fabrics mm -hmm. or uh, I also did a design for a levitate party and in that one we were using like this kind of fringe door uh, uh, yeah the door fringes that you can just like put in your door and keep going through that <laughs> so yeah, yeah uh, yeah, working with that, mapping on, on, on it, playing with lights. That's pretty much what I enjoy. Mm -hmm. I have, we have, we have files <laughs> for you now. So we can show some of your work. Um, I, it's also kind of interesting to me that, um, you know, it's sort of also to this kind of thinking beyond idols, that you, the, the crew is important, right? So we, we kind of tend to talk about artists as sort of, heroic and isolated and I don't know you go off into the wilderness and come up with some genius idea that nobody else has but the, the kind of the people around you were important actually somehow to the work that you were doing right? yeah, yeah like the, the, this club night has we, we always tried to collaborate with as much people as many people as possible so we were always like invited both music and visually vice new names and try things yeah we also formed a uh, kind of visual, audiovisual platform with my friends called uh, Lollap. And yeah, so we try to collaborate as much as possible. How did you, sort of, how did you, how did you select those collaborations? Was it kind of pairing music with visuals? Did you, did you kind of talk to one another to figure out who were the right pairings? Is it just sort of spontaneous? Tonight, you know you have a slot and you, somebody starts playing music and you have to kind of react? Or uh, how did those come yeah, about? Yeah, I guess like all of our history has been very spontaneous, and uh, we we just like uh, brainstorm ideas and uh, and brainstorm about people around us who we've seen, who we've met, who we've talked to. We have a ton of stuff in here, so I'm gonna <laughs> let you navigate your your folder. It's it's uh, here. It's on okay. this. One. So we're kind of moving things over to the second display, and then and then they're appearing. I'm not yeah. sure okay. why that is, but that's what we're doing. Yeah, so uh, these are some of the samples from uh, what I had prepared for Saturday for the non college set. Yeah, I, I tried to kind of visualize uh, some of the sounds uh, into objects and lo loops that for me, kind of represent that sound. So these are some kind of elastic spirals, and this was also inspired a little bit by th this crap that they sell in tourist shops here in Prague. Oh. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So like, uh, I worked a lot with like some ge geometry and some perfection versus versus some organic. Uh, mess and yeah visualization of, of the sound in like 3d uh, yeah like some kind of human ver versus non-human elements and from just some some yeah. video that you can show us maybe to see the stuff in motion uh, video? <laughs> Something uh, that moves? Yeah, I haven't had a video. Without giving away too much, I was like, we're going to come and see your uh, show on Saturday. Uh, yeah, I have some little samples of uh, like our events, or our club nights, like uh, the visuals I made, uh, like just like uh, like Facebook flyers or something. Like we always explore some kind of topic. So this topic for this party was uh, like esotericism. Uh, 
Kaldun. Uh, yeah, this this topic was uh, non-stop. Uh, this was a hobby market, and this one was uh, so far the last one, uh, which was called essential. It was like uh, discovering uh, the essence of the event through different senses. So I'm obligated, I mean, I asked Ignacio why, like the obvious kind of dumb question, why black and white? Why, where does this, where is this aesthetic coming from? This kind of hyper-saturated, sort of neon, uh, lots of colors, sort of really kind of coming out of the 3D software. What, what led you in that direction? Well, <laughs> I don't, I'm not quite sure I, I, I can answer this question, because like, or, or like it's, I'm a very spontaneous ADHD person and I, I don't really put too much thinking in, into like how the result is going to be. I mean, it's it kind of, an, it's an unfair question. It's, it's sort of like asking a composer like, why did you write for the piano or something? You know, I mean, like, um, but I was, I was kind of, I was curious about it. But it seems like you did kind of spontaneously commit, commit to this direction, right? There's yes, some, yes. There's like some. You, at least you feel, you feel comfortable with this, with this aesthetic. Yeah. Okay. I'm not <laughs> saying just you shouldn't. <laughs> I'm just interested. <laughs> you know what leads people in different directions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there's been, of course, I had like a wide spectrum of ideas and then at a certain point I just had to say, like, stop thinking and just do it. Yeah, yeah. Do this. Yeah, that's fair. All right, so we're about, about out of time. I'd love to hear some, qu I've, I've caught some question from the audience. Although, you, I'm, I'm also appreciate you being <laughs> listening quietly too, if you don't have a question. But maybe somebody from the audience does have a question, either for Katarina or for... Our other, our other folks before we go on to grab beers and watch the evening program? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm not judging, but I have one stupid question. Uh, I'm a visual artist and like a, a previous art director. Uh, and it's one thing is interesting for me. Why you are not following uh, like a one visual language? Like a, it's in general, it's one visual language you are following. But uh, in typography, for example, you are uh, using the sans and sans serif, uh, which is not like a supporting each other. But actually, it looks good. But uh, it's also something like a different person uh, in the same image. So do you have some answer why you are not like following the same visual language, uh, something like that? Yeah, I'm, I'm like a very not very consistent person. So, uh, like, I can't, I, I, I don't think I really can't develop something like a signature visuals. So I'm, like, uh, trying to always uh, experiment about the opportunity, and that's maybe why all these things look maybe completely different from each other. Thank you. As I say, I, this definitely, I definitely get a still, some sense of, of continuity or personality between them. Um, how how um, how different or um, how different is it for you, kind of responding to musicians? How how often? I mean, it, it seems like you get a lot of sort of artists coming through, especially with these party situations. Um, are, how much time are you spending in advance, kind of thinking about their music or kind of trying to prepare, knowing what their music will be, and how much is sort of on the spot? Spontaneous, um, it's a improvised visuals. Once, once, once you're there in the room with them. Yeah, it's uh, it. It really differs from like uh, what I come off it because like sometimes I do more on spot stuff, more more organic, or sometimes I really want to just have all the renders perfectly rendered and and know what I, what I'm doing but sometimes it's just uh, spontaneous. And uh, like I have had a problem with the spontaneity. Uh, you have a, pro a problem I, I had a problem, but yeah. then I started touring with a band and uh, uh, yeah, that, that, like the, the point is like you, you don't enjoy doing the 
same thing like 40 times in a row. So you, you really have to kind of amuse yourself by doing spontaneous things. So in the end, you did get to evolve to the state where you were really improvising and generating new stuff yeah. each show. Yeah, oh, that cool. really helped. Hmm. Other questions? So that's what this, I mean, this comes back to the art of the kind of VJ, you know, which we don't, we don't talk about so much anymore, fine, but, but um, yeah, you know, there is a kind of a desire somehow to make a, uh, especially for these sort of festival acts, to make this kind of product that's more or less the same and you, you kind of tour it around. Um, but at, the, at least f for me as an audience member, I don't know if this is because I'm an artist or just because of who I am, it's really, I really appreciate sometimes going and knowing that something is really, really live, uh, whether or not it's improvised or not, that it's really live and that there's some spontaneous kind of human element to it. Um, so that remains kind of interesting to me. Yeah, it's just something that popped into my head on that point, which is, which is a really big factor in how we develop Clark show was that we we realized uh, when we did have visuals and a big screen that there was this competition and between the visuals and what Chris was doing on stage so where do you look do you look at the visuals do you look at Chris or do you look in between two at the same time and it it we realized it for what Chris was doing, because he was performing on stage and filling the stage more, that the visuals were actually distracting and that they were taking the focus away from the very spontaneous nature of his performance, his drum machine programming or key playing. Uh, as, as that developed, it, that became the focal point of the show. So we needed something that w was just really sort of coherently fitting around the music rather than just being this big TV screen at the back with some pretty patterns on. Yeah. That was a really important decision to make. It's like, we're not going to have the TV screen. We're going to do something that's, that fills the stage more. Well, so where, yeah, so and to, that, to that idea, where should we look on Saturday night? Or have you thought about that? Yeah. We should just watch you, not yeah. the visuals. <laughs> Yeah, I'll, I'll be thinking about it. It's al always like a big art to make visuals that are not too boring, not too kind of focus catching, mm. that kind of go along at the same level with music. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm <laughs> I mean, I, I, to that said, I'm, I, I can appreciate that about kind of Clark's show that, that you, you have this kind of holistic, I mean, you still have a lot to look at. You just, it just, it just, it's kind of some sort of harmonious combination of Clark dancers and this light space that happens in the theater. I, I mean, but then there are other shows where I'm actually perfectly fine getting lost in a reverie kind of looking at a projection. So, um, and there are some artists who, where the, you feel the music is very live and you feel that you can hear that kind of spontaneity, the, the squeaking or whatever. <laughs> um, but, you know, but you don't necessarily need to watch them making that spontaneity. So it, the, those are also kind of situations where, you know, I've gone and even you've know, spent about 60 seconds watching somebody play live in the booth, but then said, okay, I don't need to watch them anymore. Actually, I just need to feel that, that, that um, spontaneity in the music. So in that case, then I'm also perfectly happy staring at visuals for an hour or two hours or six hours, for sure. Yeah. Well, so I'll be really interested to kind of see, I've seen your work online, but haven't seen it live. I'll be really interested to see that. This, the Clark show I've seen before, but I'm really excited to see it again. And there's some new elements to it tonight, right? There's a, some, some element of this is a premiere. Sorry? There's an, uh, some element is premiering t tonight, right? If I remember Something correctly? Something premiering tonight? Uh, or it's no. It's a Czech premiere, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely a Czech premiere, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and there will be, yeah, actually, there is a new track that hasn't been played before in tonight's show, so there's a musical premiere. Musical for sure. Okay, yeah. cool. So I hope to see you all later tonight. Thanks so much to our panelists and kind of experiencing this unique, <laughs> spontaneous um, acoustic environment that we're in. Thanks to the audience also for, for coping with us with that. Um, but I hope that we'll see you at some of these events and kind of continue the conversation over beers and whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, see you around. The, um, we'll be doing this again tomorrow. Hopefully we'll fix some of the acoustic problems 
and um, see you around the exhibition and the, um, and the performances. Have a good night. Thanks so much. Thank you.